and say, there is a real God. And he is right here next to us. And so I expect this morning, I expect that when we pray, I expect for God to listen. I expect for God to listen. I expect that when we worship, I expect for heaven to move and for angels to join us in worship. I expect, I expect that as we do this every single day and especially today, that not only are, is God going to hear us, I expect that we are going to hear from God. I know I'm the pastor, so I got to do most of the talking, but I expect I'm, I'm talking and listening at the same time, just so you know. I got, that's where my ADD kicks in, okay? And so I expect to hear from God as well, and I expect because of this encounter that we are all going to walk out of here a little bit different that we are going to all walk out of here even more in love with Jesus, that we're going to all walk out of here, whether if it's shutting off the screen or uh, leaving this building, I expect that we will be different because of our encounter with God. Because when you encounter Jesus, there ain't no other option. You do not. You are never the same. You are never the same. And so that's my expectation today, guys. And so you know what God expects as well? He, he desires for us to meet with him this morning. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and let's begin to encounter and draw near to our God. So let's all sit up, and let's all stand up, and let's pray. Lord, we praise your name this morning, God. I praise your name. I have, Lord, as I pray these words, I know I'm not just praying to a figment of my imagination. We know that we are not just here, Lord, to encounter an idea. We are here to encounter the presence of the living God, Lord, because there is no idea good enough that can transform lives the way you have. There is no figment of our imagination, God, that can, it, that can do what it has done to us, to those that have experienced and continue to experience your goodness, your patience, your love, and your grace. And so, Lord, I'm so thankful, God, that because of what you did on the cross for us, Jesus, because of your great love for us that never changes Lord, your arms are still open wide, waiting, inviting us to draw even closer today. And your word says, when we draw near, so do you. And I love it, Lord, that you don't draw near to us at the rate that we draw near to you. If we take a step to you, you take leaps towards us. And Lord, I pray that in this morning, each and every person, all of us here, may have that encounter with that living God, with you. And that we may never be the same again. But right now, God, we want to do one thing, and that is lift up your name. Declare your goodness. Elevate, Lord, regardless of what is happening around the world, regardless of what's happening in our lives. Lord, we are believing and we are praising your name because you are above it all. You are above it all. And we, because of that, Lord, and because of all that you have done, we praise your name. And we lift you up to give you all the glory and the honor that you are due. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, guys. This is worship our God. Let's begin to encounter him this morning.
The chains break at the weight of your glory I need a shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven given us God I mean there's so many things that we need to be grateful for and you know just being here breathing living being alive is such a such a blessing that's the word I'm trying to look for so God we just thank you for who you are we thank you for the life that you have given us Lord God whether it's rain shine pour whether we're in the valleys or the mountains, God, we sing of your goodness.
Amazing truth. God, that despite the circumstances, despite, Lord, what is, whether it's our lives or the world, God, we know God, that you, you are the King of Kings, you're King above it all. God, and ultimately, Lord, what we may have, what we have most, God, is that if those who have called on you, those who have been made right in your name, Lord, you hold us. Lord, your hold on us is greater than any hold that depression can have, that anxiety can have, that fear can have, which though present, it is nothing compared to the presence of my God. And so, Lord, it is your hold that is the greatest. It is your hold that you hold us above it all. And Lord, and, that, and the fact that that hold right there that you have, you will not release us, that Lord, you will, we will not slip through your fingers God, that you will never fail us. And because of that, Lord, we bless your name. We look to you right now and thank the living God that is so good, that is faithful, and that has never failed us, and that has been too good to us. We declare these things. We lift you up, and we lift up right now, Lord, despite all the complaints that we've had about this world. God, everything, despite all the bad that 2020 might have, God, that doesn't negate all the good that we have in you. And that's why we declare, Lord, you are good. You are good. You are good. And we lift that up right now because what we have above it all is you. Because you are good. You are good. Let's just lift that up one more time and just tell him yourself. Say, say, you are. That we have more right with God than whatever is wrong with this world. Tell him right now. Despite how you are, he is good enough. He is good enough, but we are not. So lift him up right now and say, God, you are. just good too good right has God been too good Lord we thank you we are thankful Lord because God your goodness your goodness just blows us away when we compare your goodness to ours God it is but like dirty rags just filthy compared to it is it is you can't compare and yet your generous amazing love Lord your kindness towards us, despite the kind of people we have or become or act at times. That is what's so overwhelming. And God, we bless you right now. We ask God, we thankful because Lord, you're still good and you want to keep doing, you want to keep showing, keep revealing yourself to us. And God, I pray for all of us here, watching and present, that the Holy Spirit of the living God may reveal our Heavenly Father, Christ, in the image of Christ to us right now. That we may continue to reveal and re-reveal and understand, Lord, your amazing love. If we, Whatever our concept of you, Lord, I, even mine, God, I pray that you may just continue to shatter that and help us to continue to see and continue to dive deeper into the endless depths of your love and your goodness and of your character. That we may continue to bless and hallow your name, Lord. And lift you up as you are revealed, God, I pray. The more you are revealed, I, pour, I pray. I know at the same time, the more we will be revealed. So, Lord, I pray that you forgive us of our sins. The things that we know about. 
the things, Lord, that we're still being stubborn about. Reveal our great need for you right now. Because you are the bread of life that we need. You are the daily bread that we need, Lord, to be able to live and exist and continue on. And as I pray, Lord, as we just, as we eat that bread of life of yours, I pray, God, that all, whatever the work of the enemy that is, has been done, be undone in the name of Jesus. God, that your will may be more our, that, that your will may be our will. That we may continue to surrender, Lord God, and realize there's nothing better than just living and walking with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. If you want to give God one more, uh, you know, sense of appreciation, you let him know. You let him know. You guys can uh, sit or lay back a little further, depending online how you're doing. Guys, listen, that, that revelation that we're experiencing, that is something that we ask and we believe, not just for us, but we expect it for the next generation as well. And so I'm, I just wanted to give a quick shout out because I know we got some people here. I know Fanny has been leading our, you know, some of y'all might not know who she is, but y'all y- y- need to know. And she's been leading our virtual kids team. And they've been putting out now, a f- they just completed their first month of virtual services for our kids. So we got to give a shout out, virtual shout out to all Willie, Ariana, the Valentina, Joel, all those who've been helping. And hey, if you are interested in helping to continue to even bring that to help the next generation be able to understand God now, then hey, you can just let me know and we'll, we can uh, get you on that team to be a part of that. So I know everybody, look, everybody want to be a YouTuber now, right? So hey, perfect opportunity. We got spots, okay? We got spots. We can help y'all be a YouTuber. Anyways, but guys, the whole point of even that, I want you guys, as we've been singing these songs, right, we are singing, declaring God as who? As king, right? We just declared him and lifted him up as king of this world, king of who we are. And now that is something that we ought to continue to grow in. In that we just don't sing a song and say, you're the king of my heart. Then he's like, yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, like to say that he is the king of our heart, meaning God's calling the shots. Does that make sense? Kings call the shots. Kings are in charge. Kings aren't just a little ornament that we just kind of have on the dashboard. And we say, yeah, he's my king. And so that is something that we are called to grow in. And he is not a king who will force himself, right? He is not a king and like a tyrant like so many of us have come to know. He is a welcoming and inviting king that's just waiting, really, for us. And that, and honestly, that revelation of Jesus is the big one, right? When we look at the book of Revelation, as we've been studying, if if you guys, if you've been watching now for the first time online or, or, you know, you're here today uh, and you haven't caught up a little bit, we've been looking at just the book of Revelation and not so much to hack and figure out, right? Because I know 2020 has been that kind of year, and we're not trying to see, all right, guys, so, you know, it's October, so... Well, what chapter of the book of Revelation are we living in today? All right, that, that's not the, the purpose of it. It is a greater, a greater one. It is because it is a revelation of Jesus. That's what the book starts with. The whole point of this, everything we do with the revelation, is to greater and to better understand Christ. And so this one today, what we're going to talk about is a little bit of the who is who in the book of Revelation. Because last week, for those that, that hung out with us last week, and if you came back, Man, God, okay, because last week's topic was about the wrath of God for the entire time. And if you came back, then, all right, then, then you got it. Awesome. And so with that, the whole thing about the wrath of God is we covered a lot of chapters, you know, which I encourage you to read all the way from chapter 4 through 20, I believe, 19 through 20. That's what we covered last week. And we were really focusing on the what of the wrath of God and the how, but we had to skip over a few who's. Right, but there were some characters and some individuals that had popped up during that, you know, from chapter six all the way through around twenty that we didn't have the time for. So that's what we're going to do today. Today is going to be who are some of those who's that we talked about that we kind of skimmed over. Right? Who are those one hundred and forty-four thousand that are kind of mentioned in the Book of Revelation? Who is the two witnesses that were mentioned there? Who's the Antichrist? Who is the false prophet? We're going to talk about some of those who's today, but I'm just going to warn you. It ain't going to be easy, okay? It ain't going to be easy because you got people insanely uber smarter than me that, can't fig- that are just, that debate this even today. And so the reason why it's so hard to understand this section of re- really Revelation as a whole is because there's so many elements that we, are ought to, we ought to approach literally and symbolically. Now, that's where the argument is and how much of it is literal, how much of it is not. And we would ask, well, why is God, why would Jesus be so vague? 
Why would he so vague? Because he doesn't want us to be consumed with nothing, not, not a timeline, not a who is who. He wants us to be consumed with him. And so there's a reason why certain things are vague because you shouldn't know. You don't need to know, right? You just kind of don't need to. There's other things that, are, that ought to, right, prioritize. That's what we should have. And so the who's who is, is, is different because, man, some of this is very literal. Some people take it literally. Some people take it symbolically. Also, because Revelation is a prophecy, uh, let me just kind of help you. I'm going to give you all some little ammo for when you read the Bible, okay? Every time there's a prophecy in the Bible, Old Testament, right, all of it, even the New, prophecies in the Bible are fulfilled partially and then ultimately some of them completely. So when there was like messianic prophecies about the Messiah, Jesus coming down, there were prophecies that were given in the Old Testament that were sometimes fulfilled partially and repeatedly up until the final one that kind of did it. And so that is a tradition. That is something that we have seen. So that's what makes some of this book of Revelation difficult because some people believe that while well, there's things in Revelation that have, yes, they have happened, that look like they fulfilled prophecies, but it looks partial. Like, it's just, okay, yeah, it's going to be fulfilled in this way up until the final one. But then there are some who believe, I don't know some of you guys might, and some of you know might not know, that everything in the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. There's some people who believe in that. And that's why it's kind of hard to process, because we do know this about God and the kingdom of God, that it is both now and not yet. That there are things that have come into this world that Jesus has ushered in since his resurrection. And yet we know there's something still yet to happen when Jesus comes in the final consummation and does everything and brings it all into order. All that in-between stuff is kind of where we're like, all right, so wait, what the, you know, how's this? So the, the thing, guys, it's going to be very difficult. And by the fact, by the end of this, some of you guys that are pretty confident about what you think some of these who's who's are, you might double back. You might be like, oh, hold on, maybe I don't know. Or some of y'all, because y'all like to be the argumentative types. Anybody argumentative types here? Who loves that? Who just, who's just loves to wait in? I'm like, oh, it's an argument. I just want to wait, 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 what's going on, right? And you just love to work your way into those things. Some of you might not like some of the things I might bring up, and so you're going to kind of like double down even more. I'm like, no, I'm going to be, mm, this is what I believe, okay? Which is fine, all right? But the thing, guys, is though it might be difficult to process who is who. There is something that we do know. Right, confident. When you look at the book of Revelation, there are no neutral players. You'll catch me on that? There are no neutral players in the book of Revelation. You either have people, individuals, groups that are actively promoting, actively advancing the kingdom of God or opposing it, being the complete opposite. There are no neutral players in the book of Revelation. And the reason why we're going to look at the who's who and even attempt to understand the who's who is this right here, because you, you online, everybody here, you need to understand whose side you're on. As we look at the who's who, I want you to ask yourself, whose side am I on? Am I advancing the kingdom of God, or am I not? And some of you guys might already have an answer for that. I'm like, well, hey, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. Yeah, true. But just because you got the t-shirt on don't mean you're an op, okay? Just because you got the shirt on, just because you declared, just, be, hey, just because you could be saved doesn't mean that you are actively advancing the kingdom of God because Jesus even said, Jesus even said that many of the elect, the saved, they will be deceived. And they will be contributing to opposing the very kingdom of God without realizing it. Doesn't mean they lose their salvation. It just means that they didn't realize what they were doing. They thought they were helping God and they were not. And guys, I don't want that for you. I don't want you to think that you're doing something Right, but you're scoring a touchdown. I was like, yo, yo, we going that way, guy. Oh, you, 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 you scoring a touchdown for the other team. What are you doing, right? And we've seen that, right? And my, my kid Josiah did that one time. Oh, he was, it was the cutest thing ever. He was, we were playing soccer, and he was on, on a team. And and one day he goes and he just kind of came out of his shell, right? This competitive thing came out of him. Oh my gosh, he was like four. Starts dribbling around all these guys, and me as a proud dad, I'm like, go. Go break his ankles. Do it. Oh my gosh. And so he's just doing it, and he scores, and he was so excited. And then I'm like. That's the wrong goal, man. Oh, man, bro, he's on the other side. And he was so happy that he scored a goal. And then we told him, it's that one. <laughs> it's that one. But then he got so excited about scoring a goal that he turned around and scored three more on the right side. So that was pretty cool. But, guys, listen, I don't want you scoring goals for the opposite team. Y'all with me on that? Anybody with me on that? I don't want you scoring goals on the opposite team. So let's look at the who's who, and let's figure out whose side are you on. Ready? So let's dive in. All right. Now, I'm, I'm going to have to, again, skim some stuff because we're, we're covering a lot. So, the first who's who that we're going to talk about is the 144,000 that is mentioned in two places. We see Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. 
There's 144,000 people that the book of Revelation says are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And they are sealed for a purpose. Now, the things that we know, it says that they are Jews in nature. That there are 12 groups, so 12 tribes of Israel, each with 12,000 sealed Jewish believers. And that this group is going to be a part of being a light into the nations and spreading the gospel throughout the entire known world. That is what we see in the book of Revelation. Now, again, this number for some people, it's, it's symbolic. There's no consensus agreement, all right? So some people believe the 144,000, it could mean just, the, it's, a just it's a general number of Jewish believers that God is going to use. It doesn't mean a literal 144. It could mean Jewish believers. It could mean all the Old Testament saints, right? And so there's a lot of different interpretations of the 144. And some believe it could be literal, that God and during the end times will, will highlight and select in the same way he selected 12 faith-filled Jewish believers, the apostles, and they turned the world upside down in a short amount of time with, oof, the, the, with the technology and the transportation that they had back in the day, that some believe that God will take 144. And if God, if Jesus was able to change the world in such a short radical way with 12 in a short amount of time, with 2,000, with first century technology and communication, could you imagine what God can do with 144,000 with modern day technology and modern day transportation? So that's the back and forth of this. All right. Now, what's interesting is that in the 12, all right, according to the 12 tribes that are listed, these 12s, and this is for the, the Bible geeks in the house. All right. So let me just give y'all, let me give y'all a slice of bread here. Okay. So these 12 are listed differently than the way the tribes of Israel normally outlined. When you look at the book of Revelation, I'm sorry, the book of Revelation and the book of the Old Testament, the 12 tribes are a little different. Where we have in the Revelation what's different is one of the sons, Joseph, who's not mentioned in the original, both his sons represent part of the 12. And then we have, so like the original 12 are made up of 10 of Jacob's and uh, sons and two of his grandkids. Levi is not. And so for some of you guys that don't know, just it's okay. You don't process that. But what's interesting is that when we hear them again in the book of Revelation, they're different. Joseph is mentioned, Ephraim, one of the sons is not, and one of the other tribes that wasn't mentioned is Dan. Dan is the northern tribe, the most northern tribe of Israel during that time. And so every time there was an invasion in Israel, it always came from the north. What is it about? Even that reality TV, right? They always come from the north, right? Right? Always. It's always weird like that. But they would always invade from the north, and Dan was the first kingdom, first tribe to always go down. But, but Dan was also a tribe that was the most prone to idolatry. They were one of the ones that not only would fall militarily, they would fall sometimes spiritually first. And now all of the tribes had an animal that kind of represented them. It's kind of like their mascot. Dan's was a snake. All right, so all my Harry Potter fans, this is Slytherin tribe, okay? That, that's who Dan was, right? That's who Dan was. And so what the thing is, is that some people believe, oh, well, because Dan was not mentioned, and he happens to represent an idolatrous group of people and happens to be a snake, that some people believe that the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan. Some people believe, or the false prophet can come from the tribe of Dan because of, so I don't know. I mean, we don't know that. But we do know that this is a select group of people that the Antichrist himself or the Antichrist system cannot touch until the mission is complete. That we do know when we, when we see what Jesus talks about and says. And so another group, all right, and this is another one that is highly debated and really interesting for me. It's the, there's two witnesses. So we see 144,000 sealed Jews that are apparently pushing the gospel, doing amazing things out in the world, helping people to be saved up until the very end. But then we also have two witnesses. Now, the, the fact that they're numbered, both the two and the 144, that's what makes it interesting. Because John, when he goes to heaven, at one point, the 144,000 are in heaven. And we notice that John says, I see a multitude that is beyond number. But then he also sees the group, the 144. So it's interesting that this group is numbered and separated from the mass multitudes. And that's why it's so confusing that some people think, well, I think it's real people. But, but not only do we have the 144, we have these two witnesses. Now, according to the scriptures, these two witnesses are going to oppose the Antichrist. And they're going to oppose him face to face. And they're going to not only do that, but, but really God will use them to bring judgments really upon the world. Now, are these two people, are they literal or are they figurative? Some people believe it's symbolic. Because there's an image that is given to these two witnesses of being trees and lampstands. 
both are images that we see in the New Testament and even the Old that represent the body of Christ, that, will, that represent believers in Jesus as trees that are rooted in the river of the love of God, producing fruit and lampstands, which represent the filling of the Holy Spirit and really signs and wonders being a light into the world. So some believe this is just really the, the 144 and the two witnesses are the church as a whole. Right, the, the historical church and the future church up until Jesus returns, compo- composed of both Jews and non-Jews that are going out into the world and really bringing and ushering in the kingdom of God. And so that's what some people believe. It is the witnessing church. But then the literal people believe that this is two actual people. And there's, there's the debate on this one. Some people believe the two witnesses will be Elijah and Enoch. Those are some of the two. The reason why is because if you, now this is, I'm going to lose some of y'all, so just hang in there with me, all right? Just give me a minute. When you look at the Old Testament and when you look at the Word of God, His Word says that all men are destined to die once. When you look at the Old Testament, there's only two people who haven't died yet. I know that's weird, so hang in there, all right? It was like, all right, pastor smoking something. No, I'm wide awake. I just had coffee. That's it. Listen, in the book of Genesis, it says that a man walked with God so closely that the Lord took him up, and he didn't die. And he is separated somewhere. That that man's name is Enoch. And then Elijah, a prophet, one of the the greatest, probably probably recognizes the greatest prophet that the Lord had ushered and brought brought here on earth, that he, upon dying, he didn't die. That a fiery chariot of horses came, scooped him up, went up to heaven. He did not die. He has just been separated, waiting for an appointed time. We talked about this last week that in the, the wrath of God, apparently when you look at even Jude and Second Peter, some believe that God even has certain demons that are so despicable and wicked that he has locked up for an appointed time, the end, to be released. I was like, Jesus, can you just keep them locked up? Because come on now. And I was like, yo, like, let, me just, let, me, let me just catch up. Let me catch my breath with this year. I don't know why you got that, but he does. And some people believe that these two, Enoch and Elijah, are separated, waiting. They will be the two witnesses. And the reason why we, some people believe those two is because they, on a, they, will be, they will oppose the Antichrist and the Antichrist system to his face. And they will do, you know, God will use them to do miracles and, and bring apart, bring, bring judgments on the world. Yet at one point, the, the hand of God will pull back and it will allow these two to die. And they will be resurrected at one point when the last trumpet sounds. By the way, the two witnesses pop up right before trumpet number seven. So again, last week we were talking about the wraths of God. Bowl and uh, seal and trumpet number seven are all at the very, 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 very end. All right, when Jesus then comes back and everything is done. So some people believe, oh, see, the the two people who haven't died are going to die. God will bring them back up and boom, there we go. Some people believe that. The other one is not Enoch. Some people believe it's going to be Moses. It's going to be Moses and Elijah. Moses because he represents the law and Elijah because he represents the prophets. That's a big deal when it comes to especially fulfilling biblical prophecy. In fact, some of you guys, some of all you Bible nerds out there, you know, when Jesus was alive, he went up on a mountain one day with three buddies, James, John, and Peter. He went up with Peter, James, and John. And as Jesus was praying, something happened to Jesus, right? The cur- something about uh, there was a moment that's called the transfiguration when the glory of God, the, the divinity of Christ was permeating and penetrating the, the physical nature of Jesus. And they began to see him for who he was. But then Peter, James, and John noticed, hey, who, who, who are those two with Jesus? And they noticed one to be Moses, one to be Elijah. Now, that was symbolic of that moment because Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He was the Messiah. But some people believe that Moses is going to come back. And it'll be Moses and Elijah confronting the Antichrist because they're going to confront him the same way Moses did. Because Moses, when he was with Pharaoh, what did he do? He confronted Pharaoh and to his face and brought judgments upon Egypt. And as the judgments came, it happened everywhere else but where the Israelites were. And we know that when we look at this, that judgment is going to come upon the world, yet the ones who are not going to be touched are the elect, are the saved. So some people believe that Moses is going to do a little sequel, all right? Moses is going to do an Exodus part two, and he'll be a part of that, or it's going to be those two. Now, it it could be real, and hey, God is God, so he can do that. Um, And that's the other one who's like, wait, but did Moses die? That's another debate. Some people think that, nah, because God hid him up. No one saw him die. He's kind of buried, set aside. I don't know. God is God. He, He knows what he's doing. But this is what we do know. We don't know who these guys are, and there's a, there's a lot of ideas. But we do know is that they have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, given a purpose. And the Antichrist, Antichrist system cannot touch them until their purpose is fulfilled. 
And so, and that's also a reality, guys, that as Christians, as believers, I need you to understand because Paul talks about it in his Ephesians, that he says that we are sealed and sealed by the Holy Spirit himself, empowered to, empowered with the same spirit of Christ to go out there and not just play church, but be the church. Not just go out there and say some niceties, right, but go out there and get the job done. All right. And the fact that if we walk with God, we will walk unopposed because the enemy cannot stop. The the, the enemy can't stop this train that's coming called the kingdom of God. All right. And so that is a reality. That is true. These. So we see in Revelation throughout the wrath of God being poured out. We see people advancing the kingdom of God, but we also see people opposing it. This is the fun part for a lot of people. This is one where like, yep, I already know it. Obama, Antichrist, Trump, Antichrist. I already know it, right? And this is where it gets, like, fun for people, and they get real into it, super extra. Now, the Antichrist is one of those who opposes. Now, Antichrist, obviously, so this is everything against the kingdom of God. And when we look at the New Testament, we know, and this is the confusing part, is the Antichrist a person? Was he a person that was in the past that already was, that fulfilled this prophecy that we're seeing? Partially, yes, completely, Mm -hmm. Is this an actual futuristic person that will come about? Maybe. We do know that in the, the, the Bible itself that the, the, the apostles and, and, and Paul talks about an antichrist system. Really, anything that opposes God is the antichrist system. But here in the book of Revelation, he pops up really in chapter, in really deep on chapter 13. And so this is an interesting part because in chapter 13, we kind of get this introduction. He was kind of mentioned in a previous one as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, a rider number one, right, the white horse rider. But here in 13, he says he rises from the sea. Now, the sea is interesting because the sea is a symbolic one traditionally of, when you look at the Bible, the sea represents either the Gentile world, like non-Jews. So some people believe, oh, see, the Antichrist is going to be a non-Jew or he's going to come from a non-Jewish background. But also the sea represents chaos, it represents just really that. Okay, that's a better word. There's no other better word, chaos. So that this antichrist or this antichrist system will always rise up out of a chaotic environment, bringing, offering peace, right? Because somebody is just going to be like, can someone just make it stop? Can someone just end this? Fix it, please, because we can't. Is there somebody out there who can do it? Whether if he be a person or a group or a philosophy, there is always somebody out of political and, and, and economic and, and social chaos, there will always be someone to offer a solution. There will always be a rider on a white horse promising peace and prosperity. Yet at this antichrist person or antichrist system, what will be peaceful, what will be nice, what will be white, it's counterfeit. It will eventually lead to the red horse, which is conflict. Right, because in order to bring about peace, you got to eliminate the enemy. Right, it's you know it comes to push, shove, then shoot. That's what happened. That is history right there. And then it will lead to the black corruption, manipulation, control of people, and then death. Because that is not what leads. God does not bring death. That is the antichrist system who offers life and in the end brings death. And so here some people believe that, oh, if it comes from the sea, then he's going to come from a politically chaotic world or system, which we know that's true, that this is, there's a, a desire to rule the world here. And we know that is, the, that is the devil's heart, is to be rule the world as God and be worshipped like God. That is true. We see here that the, there's images that are given of a leopard, a bear, a lion, and a dragon. You know what they all have in common? I don't know about the dragon, but, you know, we can make it up. Those are all predators, Right? Lions, bears, you know, oh my, right? Those guys, those are predators. And so this antichrist system is out there, and this is a predator of people that just wants to consume people. They don't want to help people, they just want to consume. They want to hunt. That's what this feeds off of. Is not, they don't want to help us, it feeds on us. This, is, uh, this, this antichrist beast system has been said to have many heads with horns and ten crowns. Now, whether that is a ten-crown coalition of nations, that's why some people say it's the EU. Or the antichrist will come from the EU because the EU started as a ten-nation coalition. The United Nations started as a ten-nation coalition, whatever, things like that. But we do know that crowns and horns represent authority. So we do know that God is, a, that humanity and God, the authority that he's given us, we will hand over. That we willingly hand over to people like this or systems like this, or individual like this, and this authority, we say, look, be our God, save us, and in, in fact, no, it will control us 
It will kill us. It will consume us. Now, the part where the literalists are really have fun with this because they say that the Antichrist will rule from the Temple Mount from Jerusalem, that this will be, when you look at this revelation compared to Daniel's, that this is a, around the seven-year peace treaty that, the, that God will have, or that the Antichrist will have. He will break the peace treaty with Israel halfway, and this Antichrist is violently against both the Jews and Christians. Now, even though there's been Antichrists, many Antichrists in the past, I'm pretty sure you can come up, think of a few, Right? Hitler being one, right? What is it about that? I mean, what, what is it about the, even the Jewish people, right? That, man, this is this little group from wherever. And, man, everybody just want to kill them all the time, right? Why? Because God knows, the, and I'm sorry, God, the devil knows that the Jewish people play an important role, an important role in the fulfillment of God's prophecies. And so it, the devil knows, I mean, you know, if let me, instead of beating them there, let me beat them, let me cut them off at the pass. And so that is why he constantly tries to intimidate Christians, right, from our faith and, and deceive us and try to eradicate the Jews. Because without the Jews, you can't fulfill prophecy, right? And that's what he does. And this is why even the devil, I believe, why there is such an, a demonic, antagonistic approach to even Christians, in Amer- to America as a whole. Do you guys know that out of all the nations in the world, the number one safe haven for Jews? Here. Don't, don't say people hate us because that's Trump or that's the Republicans or that's Obama, that's the Democrats and that's Hillary. That's them. No, no, no. All right. This thing runs deeper. It runs deeper than that. We are the, it is spiritual in nature. We are the number one harboring place, community for Jews in the world. And so there is something demonic behind it all. And one last thing, which is interesting because, yo, you can't be the Antichrist without trying to mimic Christ. And so we see, and John notices that it looks like one of the heads of this beast receives, seems to receive a mortal wound. A mortal wound that he, you know, recovers from or, or is resurrected. And because he receives an apparently mortal wound and is resurrected, he will then deceive the whole world and then the world will follow him. Doesn't that sound like somebody? I think there's somebody who once kind of died, I think, and then came back later, resurrected, and now has a huge following. I don't know. You guys, any names come to mind? Any names come to mind? Right, that's Jesus. And so it's interesting that the Antichrist is going to even mimic Jesus' resurrection. Now, John says he seems to receive a mortal wound. Now, look, I don't know if you, I've seen this weird app on, on Instagram, Facebook, where you can cut your face off and put it on, like, a movie character. Like, I, I saw somebody cut out Jim Carrey's face and put him on Keanu Reeves as, as John Wick. Like, I saw that. And it was, like, John Wick, but if it, was, if it was Jim, you know, Jim Carrey. Or have you ever, you know, Snapchat filters, right? You ever done the baby face, right? You, you know, you only look at you as a little baby, look at you as an old person, right? Have you ever done that? It's crazy to see, wow, that's kind of, that looks pretty good. Some of y'all, huh. Some of y'all Photoshop like way too much, okay? You ain't that skinny. You, you ain't got that curve. Your biceps aren't that big, okay? That's not you, okay? I saw you. You got wrinkles. Where'd the wrinkles go? You just took this picture two minutes ago, okay? You're like 60, okay? No, the, you know, no, 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 no. So it's interesting with technology that we have now. I was like, man, if there was anything that can kind of portray or deceive the world from if the Antichrist was a real person to receive an actual mortal wound, yet maybe it be not him, and it kind of looks state now more than ever. Wow. You know, that's called the deep fake. That it's tech, it is something that is a lie, but it's right in front of you, and you can't tell if it's real or not. That's true. I saw a movie yesterday, all right? It was uh, the, 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 the new Terminator. I, I just kind of, I was like, man, I've, I've seen all the Terminators with this, and I put it on. Man, it, they had Arnold Schwarzenegger there, and the dude looked like he was 28. I mean, that guy is, I mean, he, he big and still, but he fat. I mean, he got a gut, and the dude was swole with lats out to here. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I was like, and so it's crazy to see the technology we can do. So that, yeah, that makes sense. So some people believe that this person will deceive the world in this way. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this guy is not just a political figure. He's, he must be, he's a god. And then they'll just run to that. Maybe. It could also be an empire. That it looks like a world system that once collapsed, that was dead, will rise again. We do know that there are people actively right now trying to resurrect what was kind of like the Roman Empire. We do know that there is a radical aspect of Muslims that are trying to uh, bring about and resurrect the caliphate. And, and they believe that. And so, they, so we see this all around. So whether these be individual, specific people or not, 
It's, it, you can see why it's hard to tell. And last one, see, the Antichrist is, he's part of the dynamic duo. He's the Batman to the false prophet as the Robin, all right? And the false prophet is one, if he were a person. By the way, this one is a beast that not rises from the sea. He rises from the earth. Now, that can just mean amongst the people, like a people pleaser, or some people believe that this could be a Jew. Remember Dan? All right. This could be a Jew that rises up, and he reiterates, and he forces, and some people believe that the false prophet, maybe not just a Jew, but couldn't become a Christian. That's why so many people put, sorry for my Catholic friends out there, this is why so many people put, oh, the Pope's going to be that false prophet, because it's going to come from a Christian kind of tradition. Some people believe that. And this, the purpose of the false prophet is to point people to the Antichrist, to point people to surrender and to submit and to worship to the Antichrist. This false prophet is going to be the world's worship leader, all right? Whether if it is a person or a system, we do know, guys, that everything that is right now in this world is enticing you to worship anything and everything other than Christ. Got me? That is real. Now, whether it is to continue to be a system or one person that will lead the world into a false revival. Jesus says that around the end will be marked with a great falling away. A great, even those that are saved are, are capable and will be deceived. We do know that. And in the great falling away, there's going to be a great tribulation. But even in that midst, great, tri great tribulation, there will be a great revival at the same time. But, so, but this false prophet is going to lead a false revival, leading people away from the love of God to the love of everything else, whether if it's fame or fortune or you, really, let me just put it there, or something else. Not only is he the world's worship leader, he's going to be like an economic leader, an economic czar, as the false prophet will be the one to usher in the one world kind of economic order, bringing people to take on the mark of the beast. I'm going to talk about that next week, so I'm going to leave that one for later. Right? I'm going to leave you all a little breadcrumb. And so he's going to be the one to push that. And, and whether, again, it is a person or something else, all right, a system that, again, wants you marked for not for the kingdom of God, not by anything else, but for a different purpose. Now, again, like we saw that first side, right? We saw there is a group of people in Revelation that is actively advancing the kingdom of God. But we also see there will be a group of people both now and until the very end that are opposing God. And we have to ask ourselves, whose side are we on? Whose side are we on? And we can't just say, well, it can't happen. It's happened once so many different times. I mean, we, we, even this one makes us pause. Because, oh, can there ever be a way where the world, where the world can either gather together and be one world and have that unity oh yeah with globalization and we've marked and we've moved our way towards that and then when you when you look it's very interesting how some even in the united nations right now do you know that they war game scenarios called agenda 21 and agenda 2030 that was an interesting one just to look up now i want to be careful with that because these can be conspiracy theories and i'm not here to push a conspiracy theory i'm just telling you look this is out there and these are things that says, no, we need to bring the whole world into, in order to save the world from pollution, from climate change, from this and that. We need to bring everything into a one system. We got to get everybody on the same page, which is nothing wrong with opposing, you know, and, and you know, helping uh, the world and being responsible. As Christians, we ought to be the ones that are the most, I believe. We should be very active in preserving the, in nature and what we do because that it has an image of God in it. It reflects certain principles. It's not God, but it reflects different elements. It's a gift that God has given us that we're called to be responsible for. But with that, those are actual conversations that people are having. And I think last time I checked, there's even nations that are, are going to be wargaming a scenario in January of, hey, what would it look like if we just kind of reset the whole world into one economy? That's real. Now, whether, again, it would be a real person or a group. This is not for us to now run out there and just gone, gone, go crazy in our basements like, oh, my gosh, oh, what's going on here? Well, you know, like, any, any for that to kind of lose ourselves in this situation. Because, again, it's hard to tell. Even the smartest people, way smarter than me, don't, can't even get on one page. So, so what do we do with this? Do we just kind of be afraid of, of, of how, you know, is it this, is it that, is it my, oh, my gosh, you know? No. We can't lose ourselves if we even we can't figure out the who is who. But we do need to understand whose side are we on. And for you to realize and recognize whose side are you on, you got to ask yourself this question. Here's really the takeaway. Can you, ask, can you answer this question? You can't answer. Who's going to be the Antichrist? Who's going to be this? No, you can't answer that. Who are you? That is an answer you need to have. You hear me? Who are you? Your identity. Who are you? That is the who you need to know. That is the who you need to know. Who are you? 
Because so many of us, look, we look and we root our identity in our activity or in our affinity groups. We do that. We look at our identity and say, well, my identity is based on my activity. Look, I used to do that. I'm not the smartest knife in the drawer. Look at that. I messed that up. Look at that. So look, what happens is, okay, I, get, I mess up a lot. I tend to learn more from screwing it up five times. Oh, okay, I get it now. I, I tend to mess up more. That's how I learn a lot of times. And so the thing is, because I tend to screw up, and then I had kids, friends, teachers, coaches, adults, label me a screw up because I screwed up a lot, then I'm like, okay, so because I screw up, that makes me screw up. You see that? And because I rooted my identity and my activity, I would, every time I would do something, I would already label it a screw up even if it wasn't because that's how I saw myself. You see that? I rooted my identity in my activity, but it doesn't work that way. No, your identity is what produces your activity, right? You can be a smart person. Listen, are you smart? Anybody here smart? Uh, do you know smart people? Have you ever met a smart person do something dumb? <laughs> okay, yes. Now, they can be really smart. Just because they were dumb, does it make them now dumb? I was like, no. If they repeat it, maybe. I don't know. But anyways, you, you kind of get it. So your identity is not rooted in your activity. But let me also warn you, because this is what the world loves to do. You see it right now more than ever, man. Everybody loves to find their identity in their affinity groups. Groups that they share a commonality in. My identity is rooted in my politics. That's an affinity group. My identity is rooted on if, it's, if I'm on the blue side or the red side. That's my group. My affinity is on my intersectionality. My meaning, all right, th this is a thing where, hey, however many boxes you can check off of being oppressed, that's, oh, you're, you're oppressed just like me? All right, we're, 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 we're in a group together. And we find our identity in how we're mistreated. And, and then the more you are, it's like you're winning the oppressed Olympics kind of a thing. And so that's kind of what we do. We, so many of us look at our identity in our affinity groups of, oh, you're the same color of skin. That's my affinity group. Oh, you're, you're the same culture of mine. That's my affinity group. And now those little groups, they do give a, you know, they, they, they make up part of who we are. But it is not the final thing. It is not the final thing. So when you want to ask yourself who are you? You have to ask yourself this question. Whose? Whose are you? Whose are you? Who do you belong to? If you want to just belong to a group, let me just tell you, you are settling for breadcrumbs. If you want to, I, I, if you want to identify with just a little bit of a group, I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying in the same one's case, all right, because in a way that you shouldn't, but whatever. If you're just going to settle for your identity in groups, you are settling for breadcrumbs. It's not enough. When you ask yourself, who are you, you have to ask yourself, whose are you? Are you a believer in Christ Jesus? Whose are you is the question you need to be consumed most about. Whose are you? If you are not a believer in Christ, I'm going to answer that for you because you might not know. If you do not belong to God, if you are not called on the name of Jesus to be saved, you don't belong to him. You can't claim him. You just can't say, well, I know about God. No, it's not enough. It's not enough to know. Even Jesus said that. It's not enough to know who I am. It's not, even enough to, it's not even enough to do things for me. Do you belong? Do you know? If you are not a believer in Christ Jesus, you don't belong to him. And if you don't belong to him, you are not on the side of God. You are on the opposing side about to and receiving the wrath of God. And that is not what the Lord wants from you. So you got to ask yourself who, whose you are. And if you're a believer in Christ, you got to remember if you're a believer in Christ, you know who you belong to. Who do you belong to? Your heavenly Father. And I want to read a verse here. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. Here's the Bible verse. Some of y'all are like, is he going to preach on a verse? Yeah, I'm just going to bring it here. I waited to the very end. Here's the one verse I want to show with you today. Paul is talking to the Romans who are living in an anti-Christ system, the Roman Empire, and living with an easily, you could tell, could be an anti-Christ type Caesar and guys like Nero and these disgusting guys that were like, oh my gosh, poor people that were just used by the devil. Look what he is telling Christians, what they need to know in the circumstance that they're living in. He says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? Children of God, that we are God's children. Notice he says, and if children, what does that make us if we're his children? Heirs, heirs of God and even co-heirs with Christ 
key word, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may be also glorified with him. Everybody wants the glory. No one wants the suffering part. Let me tell you, that needs to go with it. We're going to talk about that next week when it comes to the mark of the beast and to talk about the, the commitment and how, how suffering plays in our lives. But listen, that right there, what did he want him to know? What did he want the people of Israel to know? I'm sorry, the, the Christians in Rome to know who were living in an antichrist system, you know, in light of an antichrist figure. That we are gods. We don't belong to this. We don't belong to that. That is not our identity. Our identity doesn't come from Rome. Our identity doesn't come from Caesar. Our identity comes from the living God who has taken us from enemies of God and has adopted us into his family. And now we are sons and daughters of God. And if that means that, that means we're also heirs. You guys know what an heir is? When you are an heir to an inheritance, an heir to an estate, what does that mean? That you have all the legal and the, the, the legal and uh, you know benefits and, and, and blessings and, and ben, you know priorities, whatever. You get access to all of it just because you bear a name. You get access to all of it just because you bear a name. And then obviously when a person dies, that's when you inherit it all, right? Guys, Jesus died so that we can get, receive the full inheritance of God as a child of God. Yet Jesus rose from the grave just so he can continue to, we can live it with him. He overcame it all so we, this could be possible. This is what we need to matter is who are you and whose are you? You are a child of God. Let me give you one story to wrap up. It's a boy, it's about a, sto- a boy named Anthony when he was 16. This is a couple years old now. But during the time he was 16 years old and Anthony was in the foster care system was in school he didn't have a home and and he was about to age out of the foster care some of you guys do if you don't know uh, a teenager who ages out of the foster care system the likelihood the chances that this person this child this individual will grow up to be anything it's slim to none most of these people because they're left alone and have nothing and no one they tend to make very poor choices and it doesn't end well for most and anthony knew this anthony felt like his chances for a forever family were done. So one day he goes up to his teacher who had a really great relationship with. Her name was uh, Benny Berry. I believe her name was Benny. He goes, Miss Berry, would you like to be my mom? 16-year-old asks his teacher, would you like to be my mom, Miss Berry? And she was like, Anthony, because he, he had this just great character, this great personality. Maybe she thought he was joking. But sit down and finish your assignment. We'll talk about it later. Just, just do your work, man. Stop playing. And she realized he was serious. She thought about it a little more. See, Miss Barry had never been a mother before. She didn't have the opportunity. She couldn't be a mom. And he was an opportunity in front of her. So she goes to Anthony later on and says, you asked me, you want me to be your mom, Anthony? He said, yes, ma'am. Then okay. She said yes. She adopts Anthony. And now Anthony is not Anthony, whatever his name was. It doesn't matter what his name was prior to because now his name is Anthony Barry. He bears the name of Benny Barry, Mrs. Barry. That is his name now. It doesn't matter what his name used to be because now he is, as he was adopted legally in the eyes of the state, in the eyes of anything, he is now a Barry. Though he doesn't share her DNA, he's a Barry now. And because of that, he is an heir to everything, to who she is. And what she has, that is, because that is his forever family. If you're a believer in Christ, can I remind you something? When you ask Jesus to save you from your sins, do you know you did more than just God help me? You did more. When you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Will you do that? You know what you're asking God, what you did? You're asking him, God, will you be my father? That's what you did. And when you did that sincerely, Jesus said, yes, I will. And he made you brand new. And now you bear the name of Christ. And though you might not have that holy DNA, you bear Jesus' DNA now. His blood is what is in you. And so now you are an official son and daughter of God. And that you are a part of a forever family. That the Antichrist, whatever that is, and the false prophet, whatever that is, and whatever hell can throw at you, can't undo. It can't undo. This is now your forever family. He is your forever father. And as a church, this is who we are. We're now a forever family who have done this. No matter where we are, the family you know, distance doesn't mean and make us stop being family. 
This is what we have. And as a family, as a forever family, as Christians, we ought to be a reminding community. A reminding community that when we have a brother and a sister who's falling and struggling, we need to be brothers and sisters who love and encourage one another and say, no, 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 that is not who you are. Who's you belong? You are a son and daughter of God. You are victorious in Christ Jesus. You are an overcomer in Christ Jesus. You are not lost. You are not this. You are not that. That's what the church is supposed to be. That is what we are, to be a reminding community. But we also should be an inviting community, an inviting family. Not waiting for people to come to us and say, hey, will, will you be my brother? Will you be my sister? Can you help me have God be my father? We're not here to wait for them. We ought to be an inviting community saying, hey, will, can I be your brother? Can I be your sister? Can I be your neighbor? Can I love you? Hey, can I lead you to a heavenly father? That is who we ought to be, a, an encouraging, a reminding, and an inviting community. That is who we are because of what? Whose we are. He is our identity. And I know for some of you, you might struggle with this. You might be a believer and be like, no, man, bro, but, I, but I can't, I'm still messing up with this. I'm still having this issue. Yes, I believed in God, but listen, a believer in Christ Jesus can still fall into a stronghold. But again, your activity doesn't define you. It is the acts of Christ who defines you forever. And the fact that he died, rose from the dead, and because he now lives, that activity is who defines you. It is Christ, not you. So when you want the enemy to play this mind game with you and tell you who you are based on your activity or based on your group or whatever, when the enemy is going to remind you who you are, you need to remember whose you are. Like Paul said, it is the spirit and the word of God that testifies that we are, we are sons of God. So when the enemy comes and tells you that you are still an enemy, that you are opposing God, you repent and say, no, it is the spirit and the word that declares I am a child of God. That is who I am because I belong to him. When the enemy comes and tells you, no, you're still lost. You're like, no, the spirit and the word testify. In Christ, I am found. In Christ, I am found. When the enemy says, you are being foolish. I'm like, maybe I might have my moments, but in Christ, I am called wise. In Christ, I am called wise. Maybe the world may say you are ruined. It was like, no, no, in Christ, I am renewed. I am not ruining Christ, I am renewed. The world will say, the enemy will say, you're just the same old person. I was like, nope, the spirit and the word testify that in Christ, I am a new creation. I don't look it, but I am because I believe it because God declared it. I am a new creation. The world will say, you're ignored. It was like, no, the word and spirit testify in Christ, I am chosen. The world will say, your identity is in your color, in your culture. No, it's not, it's in my creator. That is my identity. That is in, is in my creator. Oh, you're just unholy. No, no, no. It, God declares his word and the spirit testifies in Christ. I am holy. It is Christ's identity, Christ's activity who does that. Without God, I am shameless. In Christ, I am blameless. Without God, I'm a mess. Maybe still a hot mess. But you know what? In Christ, I'm a masterpiece in the making. That's different. In Christ, that is who he says I am. That is who he says I am. I am loved in Christ. And the world would say, no, you're missing something. No, no, no. The spirit and the word testify. And God, his word testifies. In Christ, I am made complete. In Christ, I am made complete. I'm not missing a thing. Now, I'm not telling you this so you can feel better about yourself. And be like, you know what? I'm pretty good. All right. I'm, you know. I'm not telling you so you can feel special about you and say, oh, look how special you are. No. I'm telling you about this because it is all in Christ. He is who is special. He is the one who deserves that glory, that honor. It is Christ in us, us in Christ. That is who we are, and that is whose we are. That is the most important. That is the most important thing we need to understand, regardless of if you know who the Antichrist is or not. What matters is who is Christ. That is the one that matters most. It's not if you know who the Antichrist is. I'm gonna ask you, do you know Christ? That is the one that matters most. Who is Christ? And when you know who he is, and when you know who you are in him, there is, whom, it doesn't matter whomever or whatever comes your way, there is nothing that can stand opposed to you when you know Christ in this way, when you know who you are in him. Because the antichrist cannot compare to Christ. Because Jesus is the real deal. Jesus is the real deal. Jesus is the one true. Jesus is greater. Jesus is the undisputed, undefeated, reigning king of kings. That is who he is. That is who he is. Forget your failures. Know who he is. Look to him. 
Jesus is the he. He is the he you need to know. He is the who you need to know. He is the who you need to know. And he is the who we need to make known. That is what we're called to do. That is what we know. So I want to lead you now as we wrap up. I just want you to just take a minute. Let's reflect. Let's worship God right now in just reflection. Sometimes I want you to know that that is worship. I want you online just to kind of just close your eyes. Everybody just kind of focus away from me, away from everything, and just kind of look inside. Look inside of who you are. I want you to look at yourself right now. So many believers in Christ, you are looking at yourself, and you need to repent right now because you look at yourself, and you are rooting your identity on your activity or your affinity groups, and you need to repent of doing so. You need to repent of thinking that your value comes from your groups, that your value comes from what you do and accomplish or not. No, your value comes from Christ. Your worth comes from him. He is who you are. So some of you, some of you have become your worst enemies. Beating yourself up. Verbally. I want you right now to take those words and bless God that he can love someone like you. And that he calls someone like you his child. Holy Spirit, as we're praying right now, God, I pray that we may worship you right now in reflection. God, I pray that we may worship you in our surrender right now. Forgive us, Lord, if, if we take more value and gain more worth from anything, from these breadcrumbs instead of you. God, it is you in us, us in you, Lord Jesus, that, that gives us and defines who we are. And I'm so grateful, God, that that's true. I'm so grateful that your grace and your blood is that powerful to do that. And I pray, God, right now that you may restore believers, your sons and daughters right now who have failed to remember that they belong to you, that you are their forever father, no matter what they have done or become. God, I pray that this, this moment of your love and your kindness, God, may lead them to repentance. I pray in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you may break any stronghold, any chains right now of sin that have come upon your people. We could come against it and we break it in Jesus' name. God, that we may, because of, in response to your love, in response to your kindness, God, may we walk further with you, looking more and more like you, walking in the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. As we're still worshiping, I want to encourage you, look, look inside and now listen to what God says who you are. And for everybody that is here and online, listen, whose side you're on matters. And the only way you can depend and, and what makes that reality is when you choose Christ that is who you are only he can do it and you have to invite him to do it you have to invite him and so if you haven't done that yet online I'm going to lead you here if that's you if you need you said I need Jesus in my life I want to say yes to Jesus for the first time if you're online I just want you to type in yes right now in the comment section drop a comment say yes if that's you you can even right here those that are here raise your hands and say yes I want to say to Jesus yes for the first time and if that's you, all you need to do is just call out to him. Call out to him in your own words. Call out to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Will you be my forever father? Who's willing to ask that for Christ today? Who's willing to ask Jesus that? If you say, Lord, be my forever father, I'm telling you, I'm going to say the answer out loud just in case you're not sure what the answer is. The answer is, yes, I will. That is God's always answer. If for those who mean it sincerely, his answer is yes. And so, Lord, I pray right now, I'm celebrating, celebrating, Lord, those who are online and those here, God, each and every one of us who are making a decision to say, God, be my father, be my king, fill me, transform the hearts. God, I believe only you can do this. And I ask God and speak and declare that there are hearts that are being transformed right now, that your law is now being written on there, on the walls of their hearts. And the Lord, that you are opening up their eyes. And I only, Spirit, you're the only one who can do this. And I pray, God, that you may breathe now life into them. That we may walk out of here, Lord, and walk beyond saying, wow, how amazing is my God. And Lord, I want to praise you because it doesn't matter what happens from here till the end. Till the day we die or the day you come back. Nothing can change. No demon no devil, no antichrist system or antichrist person can alter the fact that, Lord, we are your sons and daughters. And greater are you than anything that can come against us. We bless your name and we thank you, God, that in your hands we are secured. And then it is in your hands, God, that we are being made new. 
In Jesus' name, we pray and declare these things. Amen. Amen. If you're, if you're making Jesus that forever father, you're just glad that he, that's a great reminder. Just praise God and just thank him for that generosity that he said yes to you. That he says yes to you, yes to us. That is amazing, guys, and I want you to walk away with that amazing now. Man, who is my God? Wow, let me tell you. And, and that is a pursuit that has no end. So as we leave here today, guys, I want to encourage you as we log off, I want to encourage you to keep pressing in on who God is. Keep pressing in in your prayers and your reading. You know, we have a virtual community. If you can put the, the online, if you can put the next steps up there. You know, if you don't know, if you want some help on walking with that, what does it mean? to be a part of that forever family. Let me tell you, there's plenty of ways that you can do that. And I know 2020 is almost over and we're already kind of ramping up. And so listen, if you want to know what that's like, what is your next step to get to know Christ? Let me tell you, you, you get to know Christ better when you're connected in community. So we have an actual physical community for all my, all my family here that live in Tampa. Just go to the Get, get Connected site on our website, tabernacleofgod.church. Click on that, and you can find a way to connect here. My virtual community, that's for everybody that's in Tampa and out of Tampa, right? And so that's a place where you can also go online, see that button, and you can join that virtual community where tomorrow, every Monday night, I do a live Q&A just in that virtual community regarding the sermon. I take your, I take your questions, and I do a bunch of stuff in there. We'll pray together. We do a lot of things there and then finally if you go to our website you see anything with a blue button on there listen that blue button is just how we give because for us I said it a minute ago God Christ is the one that we need to know but Christ is the one that we need to make known all right and I want you to know now that is happening virtually but that's also happening personally physically locally because this ain't just putting on we ain't just putting money in to keep the lights on and pay the wi-fi all right now we're trying to organize we're recouping because we want to be, we want to go out there and make a difference, both wherever we are located, wherever we find ourselves, because that's what we're called to do. Know Christ, make him known. And so, guys, I want to encourage you, don't just be a passive consumer, all right? Online, everybody in here, take a step. Take a step. And that's one very easy way where you can get connected, all right? So, you know what? Uh, normally, we read our benediction. I want to pray a blessing over everybody, and then we're going to read our benediction. Lord, may the Lord God now bless and keep each and every one of you. May he open up your eyes. And may he help you to see who you are in him. May the Holy Spirit of the living God continue to reveal to you this week not only who you are in him, but may he remind you whose you are. That hell and death and the devil have no longer a claim on you when you have placed your faith in Christ, that you are his. May he give you the strength to resist temptation, the strength to not buy into the lie that that is anything different. And may you have peace to know that you have a forever father and a forever family in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand up together. Let's read now our benediction and let's declare that over each other, over our city, over the world right now. Let's read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Guys, I would love to say hi to everybody online in person there. Uh, if you want to say hi, if you want prayer, you can feel free to come to the front. And I want to encourage everybody, let's take that next step this week. All right. God bless you guys.